no. yeah, computerized <laughs> records. Right. Because so, everything's redundant. People keep pushing buttons and repeat everything at the same time. And you got a, that one little nucleus right. of information that's new. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but it looks like they did a hell of a lot. But charts, yeah. instead of being this and that, you think in the old days are like this now with the review of the system. And so they're great for documentation, but it can be a terrible issue. Yeah. You know. <laughs> 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 I spend half the time with me knowing our dates are on the fourth page or after, and of course, you got a date from somebody who printed it once. I know. And then somebody Yeah, I love it. I mean, you know, the history 
speech therapist friend says she uses it with the VCD people all the time. No, she uses it train I was her to I didn't know they were using that. If that's what she uses, I had never heard of it before. She says it's really great for these people. What does it do? I'll probably it's, it's a variable resistance, so when you start closing down, it pushes harder and then stop closing down and relax. Well, from there, but it just changed my clarification. They wear it all the time. Or no, or not just when they have an attack. Wow. I have a new uh, <laughs> speech therapist. Maybe she'll let me know. The one I use for years is retired. We did all the best BCD stuff. Uh oh. <laughs> Maybe she'll know about it. Uh, I have no idea. Let's go ahead and uh, get seated and get started today. We're continuing. Uh, oh, wait. Just. Um, one, one small announcement before we go. Just, I don't know why there's so much confusion about the yeah. next week, but just to remind you, we have one more session here a week from today, same time, same place. Paul McBride is presenting. Yeah. yeah. In the last session, the dinner function is the next evening, Wednesday, over at Polaris at about um, 6.30. Uh, so again, I don't know why people are confused. It's an event Tuesday morning and Wednesday evening. And that's, that's the end until we'll pick up again in mid-September. So today, uh, continuing a very enjoyable tradition, uh, Greg Gardner is nice enough to come and update us on rheumatology, what we need to know as allergists. I always enjoy his uh, historical perspectives on this. I think he's got some of that for today as well. Greg? It's always a pleasure to come uh, speak to you, although 6.30 is uh, getting up at 5.30 is my favorite time, but the uh, traffic was great this morning. It was, uh, it was so I, uh, I've talked to you in the past about uh, Pierre Gustrenois and his rheumatoid arthritis, and also uh, Raoul Dufy and his RA and his treatment with, um, with cortisone. Um, I'm going to talk to you about another artist who had uh, another rheumatologic disease. It's Paul Klee. Who had scleroderma. This comes from an article from uh, journal Pharos by Rick Silver, who's a scleroderma specialist. So uh, Ted Harris, who died a few years ago, a very prominent rheumatologist, uh, in the introduction to this article, talked about the narratives that Asians tell us. We get the history, we do the physical, but if we dig a little bit deeper and listen very carefully, uh, sometimes there's other narratives that the patients tell us. Um, for example, there's what's called a restitution narrative, where patients will say, I'm sick now, but I'm planning to get better. Uh, there's a plus narrative where patients will say, I'm not quite sure if I'm going to get better, but I want my illness to have meaning. And uh, so those are the people who you know, are involved in fundraising for uh, the A, is it AAAAI, or you know, those sort of things, um, or uh, lead uh, you know, self-help groups, those sort of things. Then there's chaos narrative, where the patient is really uncertain about uh, what the future holds for them. Anyway, Paul Klee, uh, this picture of Paul Klee, um, uh, up in the right-hand corner there is a young man. He was born in Switzerland. Uh, his mother and father were very accomplished musicians, um, and they envisioned a music career for Paul as well. But Paul didn't like music uh, as well as he liked drawing, uh, and he uh, became quite good at it and joined uh, uh, right around World War I, the Blue Writer Group, uh, which was an avant-garde group of artists, 
uh, around 1914, 1915. Uh, World War I broke up that group to some degree, and some of them actually died uh, in the war. Uh, but he continued his art, and he became uh, again, quite famous. Uh, he went to Tunisia, and there he found uh, colors and things that, that he'd never experienced before. Um, and uh, that transforms his art. You can see he's a very expressionist type of painting. Uh, there's Southern Gardens after his Tunisia trip. And down below, in 1922, it's called The Twittering Machine. Um, and again, it's a very expressionist type of art. He was appointed to the Bauhaus in Weimar, uh, which was a very prestigious art academy at the time. Uh, moved to Dusseldorf uh, later on. And in 1933, his life and career changed drastically. That's when the Nazi government took over and uh, forced many artists, uh, especially avant-garde artists, to flee. Uh, he and his wife went back to Switzerland. Um, uh, some of the German painters who stayed in Germany were forbidden to paint, uh, and their, art, their work was classified as degenerate. And um, this is actually Goebbels and Hitler attending one of the degenerate art uh, shows. Well, they went around Germany uh, showing how demented and psychotic these artists were um, and uh, well, a lot of uh, Klee's paintings were, were, were uh, uh, confiscated and destroyed um, because of that, of that attitude. Anyway, in uh, Switzerland his colors uh, uh, blossomed and he became a little stronger in his uh, in his style, but the Swiss were fairly conservative and they had a sort of a lukewarm reception to his art. About 1935, he began developing Raynaud's phenomena. Uh, then they got a little short of breath and his skin began to get tight. Um, and uh, this is what he says about what, here's an artist's description of Raynaud's phenomena. If you read down on the bottom, there is nothing more hostile than water turning into ice. Never before had I endured such pain in my fingers during such hot weather. Um, and uh, down below there is what's called captive. So this 1940, this was fairly, uh, fairly advanced, um, and uh, he's painting how he feels as, as a captive in his own body. Um, I love this. Uh, look at this um, <coughs> graphic up there in the right, right upper hand corner. So he's died by 1936. Look at his art output. This is graphing how many paintings he did per year. In 36, it was almost nothing, and he probably went into depression uh, regarding his uh, scleroderma. But then he had a resolution in his mind of, of, of the process, and he knew he probably was going to die. He said, De death is nothing bad. I long ago we reconciled myself to it. How do we know what is more important, our present life or what comes after? I won't mind dying if I've done a few more good paintings. Uh, and then look at his output, just skyrockets as he recognizes he doesn't have long to live. So he paints uh, prodigiously. Um, and then finally, naturally, I've not struck the tragic vein without some preparation. Several pictures have pointed away, and their message the time has come. And down below is uh, it's called A Sick Man in a Boat in 1940, as he crossed over the river Styx, is that, is that, uh, that image. And look at Paul Klee around 1940. You showed you a picture of him before. Look how, how thin he looks. His, his, uh, his hands are tight. Um, and um, he dies uh, not long after that, fairly peacefully, uh, in, his, uh, in his sleep uh, from severe scleroderma. So what was Paul Klee's narrative? Um, Ted Harris thinks it was a chaos narrative. It really was a, uh, more of a quest narrative. To describe what it's like, to, uh, but in art, to uh, to have a severe, debilitating, life-threatening disease. Um, I've always been impressed with the way he handled that, uh, and it's a good example for me when I get my terminal illness. I guess. Um, I thought I'd pick two topics. I think what could I tell allergists that might be useful to them? So I, I picked one topic that. We sort of share, and you probably will see some of these patients. But I think the second topic that you'll, you probably won't even deal with at all, but is a fascinating story, uh, and it updates you in some rheumatology. 
Have any of you seen IgG4 uh, patients uh, yet? They're out there, and uh, we didn't recognize them until um, recently. Uh, this is a relatively new diagnosis for rheumatologists as well. So this is uh, one of my patients as a former uh, Microsoft uh, executive, 45-year-old woman with a history of autoimmune pancreatitis, diagnosed by Bruce Gillen, if some of you remember Bruce, back in the early 2000s, uh, comes for recent onset of low back pain. Uh, she also had a rising creatinine and found to have hydronephrosis by <coughs> renal ultrasound. She's got mild hypertension, hypothyroidism, and autoimmune pancreatitis. Examination, she's a little hypertensive, otherwise normal. Non-contrast CT shows periaortic mass involving the ureters, concerning for retro peritoneal fibrosis. Tissue biopsy shows fibroinflammatory tissue, found to have an elevated IgG level in the, in the serum at 676. In our lab at the time, it was 8 to 140, so that was uh, definitely elevated. But at the time, when Bruce made the diagnosis, he wasn't quite sure what that meant. Um, uh, now we know. So there's a, a whole range of uh, diseases which had names without a unifying pathology, uh, without the familiar. Some of you may have heard of these di diagnoses. Mucklitz disease, this is elevated uh, enlargement of the salivary glands. Kuttner's tumor, submandibular gland enlargement. Rydell's thyroiditis, which is enlargement of the thyroid. Chronic explosive erotitis, and on and on, including retroperitoneal fibrosis. Autopancreatitis, uh, eosinophilic angiocentric fibrosis, and it sounds somewhat allergic. Um, all these diseases, which simply had names, now have a unifying pathology, and that many of these patients will have IgG4 disease. So IgG4 disease is predominantly seen in men, uh, but not, not always. Um, generally age 50, so about uh, my age group. Um, and most of the work on IgG4 disease has actually been done in Japan. Uh, the first syndrome was autoimmune pancreatitis, and 6% uh, of all cases of chronic pancreatitis are felt to be autoimmune in nature and associated with this IgG4 disease. First described around 2003 um, in a patient who had uh, autoimmune pancreatitis. Described on histology of this lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate uh, with abundant IgG4 staining plasma cells, as well as a very characteristic fibrosis. Uh, hopefully, I'll take you away some very, you'll take away some very uh, basic points about uh, about this diagnosis. <laughs> Since then, there's been a flood of case reports and case series of these patients who have IgG4 disease. Uh, John Stone, one of our colleagues uh, in rheumatology, has really been a leading researcher and, and writer on this topic, and a lot of the review cap the papers you will see, including one in the journal from 2012, um, are uh, written by John Stone. So what about the IgG4 molecule? What is it? It's a very unique molecule, as I, again, reviewed for uh, this presentation. I learned something about it that I didn't know. Uh, it's not very common. It's not, it's just in terms of IgG4, it's one of the least common of the IgGs. Um, it has uh, minimal binding to C1Q and FC gamma receptors, so it doesn't really fix complements or, or activate the complement cascade. It also has this unusual characteristic of what's called engine binding arm exchange. Now, what does that mean? Well, I'll show you a picture in a second, but very basically the intra ch uh, chain bonds between the heavy chain allows association of those chains, and they can be combined with different change of different antigen specificity. Uh, again, I'll show you a picture, it's, uh, it's wow. It's like a high number of five. The other thing is, uh, it's production of IgG4 is favored by what allergists see more of, uh, the Th2 response. Um, and uh, IgG is often produced in some of these patients, but uh, again, the um, some of these patients actually have atopic disease as, uh, as sort of a baseline as well. What is uncertain is whether the IgG4 participates in a tissue destruction fibrosis that's seen, or is simply an inflammatory pr product caused by this Th2 response to inflammation. There's a lot that isn't understood yet about uh, the syndrome, but uh, again, uh, the more we see, the more we'll understand. So, 
it's produced as a homobivalent antibody. Uh, and those, there, the picture in the middle there shows you the intrachange as opposed to interchain bonds. It keeps the molecule together. The, those whole chains can disassociate, and then they can reassociate with uh, chains of different specificity. So you can have an antibody with two arms, but each of those uh, antigen binding sites may be different. Now again, I'm not quite sure why um, it, it, that's done. I'm not sure what the benefits uh, uh, of that process is uh, to us in a normal world. Tissue is really the issue when we're thinking about IgG4 disease. Um, some patients with IgG4 disease can actually have normal levels of IgG4. Uh, they're very responsive to steroids, so even a little bit of prednisone will lower those IgG4 levels. What you see in pathology is this dense fibroplasmacytic infiltrate. Uh, CD4 positive T cells are present, um, and uh, IgG4 producing plasma cells are more than 50% of the present plasma cells in the tissue. It's organized as what's called a storyform fibrosis. Now, you can hear that from your pathologist. Think immediately about the possibility of IgG4 disease. Sort of a spokes on a wheel. I'll show you a picture of that. Also seen in the pathology is obliterative phlebitis. Uh, so the veins, for some reason, are attacked and uh, obliterated in this process. Uh, and also you can see a mild to moderate eosinophil infiltrate. What you don't see are neutrophils or granulomas. So if there's granulomas in this tissue, it's probably not IgG4 disease. Question? Yes. But you're also not seeing a complement, immune complex deposition. You can see immune complex, but you don't see complement. Uh, so there's, again, I don't, I don't understand that difference, but uh, uh, in the picture I'll show you, they do pull in blood. There's immune complexes, but not, um, uh, probably pretty small, again, because they can't associate very easily. So it's, uh, again, I don't quite understand exactly what that means, but. Uh, that's right. You don't see you don't see complement deposition in the, in this in this tissue. So when the when the bonds switch over to bonding new antibodies, does it then fix complement, or is that no no? It still does not. The the uh, IgG4 FC portion for some reason doesn't bind uh, complement at all. So even after it switch chains with right. other molecules, it still doesn't. Right. Okay. So here's some, some histology that, that might be useful to, just to think about. So on, the, on, on A there, that's a lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate. You can't see very much there. But there's the number B up there with the little the arrowheads. That's called storyform fibrosis. You can see sort of the, they put a little center mark in there, and you can see the, uh, the fibrosis sort of radiating out from that central area. On the middle panel, C and D, there's a, a, a low and a high power um, uh, view of uh, the stained IgG4 plasma cells. You can see they're quite abundant there. Um, on E, the arrowheads are pointing to what used to be a vein, the margins of the vein. The vein has been completely uh, obliterated by this process. And then finally, the bottom one is. Uh, See the longer arrows pointing towards a plasma cell, the arrow head towards an eosinophil, and the smaller arrow to a fibrocyte or a fibro fibroblast. Again, those are classic sort of pictures of IgG4 disease. There is some genetics involved, and there's some SNPs that have been identified but not quantified. And again, this is a very new syndrome, and more and more information will be coming out. I'm not quite sure what, what sets the whole thing off. Uh, is a TLR uh, engagement uh, important? Um, and uh, there's homology between H. pylori proteins and some of the pancreatic cell targets uh, in this disease. Is it a molecular mimicry sort of process? Is it autoimmune? Uh, stay tuned. We know there also is activation of Treg, and uh, a lot of uh, IL-10 and TGF beta is produced. TGF beta is an important one for us rheumatologists because you know it's involved in scleroderma, causing fibrosis. Um, so those uh, those two cytokines are important in, in this disease. So here's the mechanism again: what process causes it? Nobody's quite sure. 
Th2 predominant over Th1, T reg production, uh, the right cytokines are produced. You get this tumefactive uh, enlargement of various organs, uh, fibrosis and destruction. Um, the process can occur where you get less IgG4 cells and more fib fibrotic tissue. Um, but again, there's that characteristic pattern that helps us know that's what this was. So, again, this is, I think, is important for, for you all because you may see some of these patients because a good chunk of them do have uh, atopic disease in their background. Um, and uh, what you see clinically is subacute enlargement of a variety of different organs, lymph nodes, um, uh, et cetera. Let me show you some pictures of some of, those, some of those tissues that can be involved. So on our top left, this is... Uh, Kutner's tumor, which is submandibular gland enlargement. Um, down on the bottom is uh, Rydell's thyroiditis, which again is this tumor factor enlargement infiltrated by IgG4 disease. Uh, this is uh, the, the CT scan. If you see the, the left main stem bronchus down there, it is partially occluded by this, uh, this mass, which is IgG4 related. And the pathology is down on the bottom there. Uh, you can get pink, uh, pituitary involvement, to remind me about that. Um, one of the things you can see, this is, uh, this is a PET scan. I'm sorry it didn't show up very well, but there are numerous lymph nodes that are enlarged. And John Stone, last year, as I was wandering around on uh, the poster session, John Stone was there with a poster with one of his fellows indicating that PET scan is a way to determine how extensive the disease is. It's not very common to have just one site involved. Often when you have this process, it's more than one site that's involved, and the PET scan or a CT scan can help you determine how much uh, of the tissue in the body may be involved by this IgG4 disease. And this is a case, uh, we actually see quite a bit of retroperitoneal fibrosis, sort of a retroperitoneal center in rheumatology at the U. Let's see if my arrow will work here. That's going to go up. Uh, anyway, uh, can you see the, uh, the, the order there? It's, it's sort of encompassed by this, this tissue mass. That mass is big enough where it interferes with the ureters, and patients often present uh, with RPF uh, with uh, back pain from hydronephrosis. Um, you also can get inflammatory aortitis with this as well. Um, here's uh, here's Mucklet's disease, and the current patient looks very much like the historical patient from the 18, uh, 1890s. Um, you can see, uh, this patient actually has enlargement of parotids. Some digital glands are enlarged, and he's got dacroadenitis as well. Um, again, enlargement of the, uh, the glands that supply uh, liquid to the eyes. So he has multiple organs involved. And I bet if we, if we PET scan him, we probably see some more areas that are involved as well. This is Mucklet's disease, now uh, uh, identified as IgG4-related disease, which is the official name currently um, for, of this syndrome. Here's a patient with autoimmune pancreatitis. And you, uh, you can see that strip of the pancreas. Now you should look at CTs of the abdomen. And that little that long sort of uh, um, uh, tissue uh, mass thing is kind of coming down over there. Uh, is there another thing you can get? This patient has is tubulo interstitial nephritis, which is more recently recognized associated with this IgG4 disease as well. So, as time goes on, we'll probably figure out more and more things that are associated with, uh, with this. Uh, uh, there's my arrow pointing towards the pancreas, and uh, my arrow pointing towards the tubulo interstitial nephritis that occurs with IgG4 disease. We've also seen several patients in, in our clinic who have this inflammatory thoracic and abdominal aortitis. Um, and uh, this is a series of patients. Uh, they found 51 cases uh, out of a total of 232 cases which were IgG4 related. This is from thoracic surgeons who are looking at these, uh, these patients. Um, and they found that a lot of these patients actually were female. Uh, so the ages there, uh, underlying diseases, 
and uh, again, a very fibrotic uh, involvement, inflammatory involvement, and fibrotic involvement of the adventitia uh, uh, with uh, secondary involvement of the intima, but causes the uh, whole thing to look very inflamed and endemitous when you look on CT or MRI scan at these aorta. I got a, a close up of the, uh, of the fibrosis that's occurring in these patients. You see these on CT, they're quite impressive. They get very thickened. Um, endemitous uh, tissue um, that, uh, that luckily responds fairly impressively to steroids. Um, so how do we make a diagnosis of IgG4 disease? High degree suspicion. Q phase reactants may be normal. IgG4 is elevated in a majority of patients. Um, and it's, uh, you want to see it sort of isolated as opposed to part of hypergammaglobulinemia. And again, as I mentioned before, tissue is the key in IgG4 disease. Imaging, CT, or PET can help us determine if there's, if there's a more extensive disease outside of the, of the target organ uh, that we might be able to follow. And uh, as I mentioned, these patients are really, really sensitive to steroids. That's, luckily, this thing is relatively easy to treat. Depends on the amount of fibrosis, though. If there's a lot of fibrosis there, the patient won't respond that well. If there's not much fibrosis, they will do quite well. But usually, uh, a modest dose, moderate dose of steroids uh, uh, with a taper over three to six months. Uh, other things like methotrexate, azathioprine, and mycophenolate have been uh, used as steroid sparing agents and remission maintaining agents. Uh, Johnstone has championed the, uh, the use of rituximab. Anybody here have experience using rituximab in any diseases? So some do. Yeah. We use it a lot in rheumatology these days for all kinds of things. It's, um, Ganesh Raghu, who I work with on Fridays, he and I have a uh, rheumatology pulmonary fibrosis uh, clinic. Uh, he, 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 he thinks that it's all we use in rheumatology is rituximab. We use so much of it. But patients who don't tend to respond to steroids very easily for some reason, we think they're still active disease, um, rituximab has, has emerged as a very impressive agent to treat these patients. I've seen a couple patients, several patients with uh, hypertrophic pachymeningitis, which is thickening of the, uh, of the line of the brain, uh, which also is IgG4 related. Again, they have an absolute impressive response to rituximab at reducing uh, their symptoms and um, evidence of inflammation. The outcome is not quite clear yet. It appears that these patients do pretty well, again, if we can get them before they fibrose. But long-term data is not uh, available for a lot of these patients because, again, we haven't recognized uh, the syndrome. I can tell you, though, that taking care of a lot of people with retroperitoneal fibrosis, it tends to run a course. You treat them for with steroids and methotrexate, and then after two or three years, you begin taking the, the medications away and after a period of time, I keep CTing them and nothing else shows up. So I think there is a, a definite period of time where inflammation is present, you treat them, um, you can taper the medications away, the disease uh, doesn't appear to come back. Um, the first patient I presented, uh, Microsoft executive, she um, has done quite well off, she was on prednisone and methotrexate, I tapered her down, left her on a very small dose. And she seems to be doing quite well on a very small dose of methotrexate without return of any of her, uh, her manifestations. Can I ask you a quick question? With, with the pathology and the staining for IgG4, what I've seen from a few cases is, especially if it's late in the disease, and gross, that can be lost. Uh, that you're no longer staying for IgG4, but you see the other pathologic findings. Is that common, and do people usually diagnose that as still IgG4? You know, I have a, much, a lot of experience with that, but I, I would have to say probably yes. And the features are characteristic of that. But even then, the patient might have IgG4 levels elevated yes. in the periphery. Um, so that may be helpful as well. But it really is that those characteristics, that steroid form fibrosis, the obliterative phlebitis that gives you a clue as to what it is. Um, I can't say there are cases where it's just so fibrotic that people can't tell what it is when, and that may be true. Yeah. And as you look at some of these patients with uh, retroperitoneal fibrosis, uh, what also seems to happen is they, they, they come down to a certain level that doesn't always go away completely. There's always some 
fibrotic tissue left behind. Those are resolved entirely. That's a fascinating condition. Surprise allergists haven't really heard much about it yet. But you talk about a total hypergammaglobinemia with a poor component, but has anyone looked at specific epitopes with respect to reactivity of these IUD4 molecules? Are they directed at one thing or another? The only thing that I'm aware of, again, is this, is this reactivity with, with the proteins of H. pylori. Again, there's some homology between those proteins and the proteins that seem to be attacked and in, in autoimmune pancreatitis. So again, there's some molecular mimicry involved. This is the only thing that I know about. Um, but that's a great question, and I'm sure at some point people will start looking at those and using various libraries to try to determine if there's, you know, what, are the, what are the antigens that are being attacked in this situation? Great question. What's thought to be the mechanism with the rituximab? I mean, you're, you have an elevated IgG4, and then you magically make that go away with rituximab. What does it target? You know, it, that's a fascinating question. So we use it for a lot of diseases like, uh, I think I talked about Wegman's granulomatosis, rheumatoid arthritis, various forms of vasculitis, pachymeningitis, all kinds of different things. But, you know, it's a CD20 depleter, and CD20 is present on teenage B cells, not on plasma cells or memory cells. So one would ask, how the heck does taking out a, a, a teenage B cell affect your plasma cell production of IgG's? And uh, it's kind of something we don't know about the immune system, and so it must be that those teenage B cells are very important uh, in, in either T cell help or... Uh, Elaborating BAF or other B cell activating factors that keep those plasma cells uh, working and active. So I, I can't really tell you. I don't know if anybody really knows as when you deplete those teenage cells, why does it affect your plasma cell production of IgG? Yes. Last time I read about this disease, there was still pretty much a question whether the IgG4 was pathogenic or not. Is there an because it, it's usually felt to be anti-inflammatory. Is there an animal model that's been developed where they can see if there's passive transmission disease if they give the IgG4 or something like that? You know, I didn't see one of those. I looked for that. Because the question, yeah, it came up, as I, as I mentioned, is it simply a marker of the type of inflammation that's occurring, uh, or is it actually, actually pathologic? Since they, don't, since they don't fix complement, what are they doing? And uh, are they involved in the destruction of the uh, of the tissue? Mm -hmm. So stay tuned. <clears throat> what happens if there are a pair of atopic disease when you treat it? You know, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, of course, mm -hmm. anything you give your tuxum to gets better, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, this this right. may be a naive thing. Did you tell us the first story because scleroderma has any of this pathology going on, or are they just too unrelated? Too unrelated. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Until later today. Good question. Uh, yeah, you're, you're anticipating. I've started to actually figure out how to turn that in, but I'm not. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Gardner, do you follow the IgG4 as a marker of disease activity, or do you follow a sed rate or CRP or anything like that in these patients? You can't follow a sedative CRP. They're often not elevated. IgG4 will disappear very quickly with steroid uh, therapy. So what you really do is you follow the clinically uh, five size of the mass. Imaging is probably the most useful way to follow these patients because uh, the IgG4 level is very sensitive to any kind of immune suppression. So it really is, most of the things are large masses, and you can follow them clinically, or you can image them to see resolution. PET scanning can be, although it's very expensive, can be used to determine whether some of the lymph nodes of uh, enlargement have, uh, have gone down. So it really is a, it's a more of a clinical feel or image of C sort of uh, way of following these patients. Good question. One more. And is there any hint of that infectious etiology preceding this in their histories, or have they been sure that they look for that? Um, Again, part of it has been, one of the questions has been, is molecular mimicry, and uh, there's been no consistent data that I'm aware of, you know, that they've actually shown uh, infectious or whatever. But again, stay tuned. The next few mix them, maybe they come back, I'll have uh, maybe a little update if I can, if I can remember to do that. Is there any target of the IgG4? I mean, have they found out a specific molecular target? or? A well, the only thing I know about, again, are those epitopes on, uh, on the pancreas that, that, uh, that are similar to what you see in H. pylori. So they do have some target uh, epitopes uh, that they know about. Whether those are uniform to the periaortic region, to uh, tissue in the, in the thyroid, or the 
parotid gland. I don't know if anybody's actually known. And can the pathologist stain specifically for IgG4? Yes, they stain the plasma cells for IgG4. So if you're concerned about IgG4 disease, ask your pathologist to make sure you do an IgG4 stain on that tissue. And I showed you the, uh, uh, on that, those brown cells. That was IgG4 producing cells. So they actually can't do that. And they're used to do that because we ask enough now. The pathologists know how to do that. So it's not a hard thing to do. And they don't see it in tissue. They just see the plasma cells. They don't see where it actually goes after that? Yeah, they can't stay IgG4. Nobody's done that I know of any IgG4, uh, like a sandwich uh, sort of process to find out what the IgG4 molecules are. They stay just for the IgG4 plasma cells. I don't mean this facetiously, but has the alternative medicine community picked up on this? Because it actually fits right into their theories about elevated IgG4 and hand inflammation. No, I don't follow that literature, so I don't know. <laughs> I, I didn't realize what they do about it. So. Right. Don't let them know this. Sounds like Is a normal IgG4 a good way to rule out the disease? No. Okay. So, again, IgG4 is, is elevated in 70 80% of people with IgG4 disease. So, the way, the way to rule it out would be tissue where you see neutrophils or granulomas, which is how you something like different. Let's go ahead in the last uh, 20 minutes. Let me tell you about uh, something that you probably don't even think about. You don't think about it at night is why do humans have uric acid and uh, all the creatures don't? I'm sure you, you, wait, you, you lay awake at night thinking about that, right? It's just, just, it's just last night. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to teach you a little about the gout, which is it's actually a fascinating story, uh, and I'll try to do it in 20 minutes. It's a classic gout patient. You probably remember from your residence. 45-year-old Filipino-American male with a history of mild hypertension who comes to your clinic with one day of severe pain in his left first toe and medial ankle. He's not able to walk on it without severe pain, and even the sheet on it is uncomfortable. He had similar yet milder attack a year ago. He's on hydrothiazide, he drinks lots of beers, he's overweight, he's got, hyper, he's got hypertension. Uh, he's got severe redness and swelling of his ankle and the first MTP. His uric acid, though, level is normal, 6.7. So does that dissuade me that this is gout? Absolutely not. So here's somebody with a from teaching slide set with classic gouty arthritis involving both the ankle and the first MTP. Look how red and painful that is. Uh, and there's a picture of the crystals. They're yellow one way, blue the next, under polarized uh, compensated light. Long, thin needles. They actually look painful when you look at them under the microscope. And uh, this is old disease. My patients in North Carolina used to call this the gouch. And I thought that was very appropriate. Um, and uh, this is from the 17th century or 18th century that uh, showed a little devil coming up in the middle of the night and gnawing on your toe. It's such a painful thing. So why do those little crystals cause so much darn pain? Well, as it turns out, you can have toe fight. You can have huge collections of uric acid, and they don't do anything. And that's because they're often coated by apo uh, lipoprotein, and they become uh, uh, unseen by the immune system. But when we lower uric acid, as it turns out, or there's a change in uric acid, those crystals become uncovered. Uh, they dissolve, they, be, they, re, they reform. Now they're IgG coated, and they interact with the uh, TLRs, activate the, uh, uh, the innate immune system, and produce tons of IL-1. And here's, uh, this is called the NALP3 inflammasome, that you're probably aware of. It gets activated by crystals. There's two signals, if you remember. There's a TLR signal and the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, in internal uh, TLR. Uh, and uh, that act becomes a capsaic uh, activator, which then uh, cleaves uh, pro IL-1 to, to uh, IL-1. And that gets released into the circulation. A couple of points remember about gout. Most, it is the most common form of inflammatory arthritis in men over the age of, uh, of 40. And it's becoming more common. Maybe you want to guess as to why we're seeing more gout? More fat. What's that? More fat. More fat. Exactly right. Hyper uh, weight uh, is definitely related to uh, hyperuricemia and gout. It's rare in women, premenopausal, we're seeing more women with gout because of both medications used and also weight. 
Uh, first attack occurs after years of hyperuricemia. The first MTP is involved in, in almost uh, in all patients at some point. But almost any joint can be affected, including the, uh, I saw a case not too few, a few years ago from Harborview, where the disc had a tophus and caused severe pain, uh, had a gouty attack in the disc, and uh, people thought it was infection. But when they biopsied it, it was a, a tophus. Uh, uric acid level uh, predicts uh, development of tophi, and they like to go to cool places, the ears, the fingers, the elbows, the toes. Uh, and uh, uric acid will go down to a normal range, often. During the <coughs> I've seen as much as two or three points of uric acid decline during acute attack of gout. Yeah, again, as you, I guess as you tend to form those things into uh, crystals uh, from soluble state, the uric acid level can actually go down. Certain groups, uh, including Pacific Islanders, have a genetic predisposition in gout for gout. They have a renal uh, uh, abnormality that uh, allows them to retain uric acid more easily than other people. So a lot of Pacific Islanders, when they come to the U.S. and eat our high purine diets, get horrible tophaceous gout. Uh, anything over 6.8 is abnormal. So 6.8 milligrams per DL is abnormal for uric acid. Um, so as it turns out, you know how they do, how they measure normal laboratory levels. They take a population, they take the mean and then two standard deviations above that is considered the normal range. Well, as it turns out, the normal range for uric acid in the laboratory keeps getting higher, and that's because Americans keep getting bigger and uric acid go up. So I had a, one of my physician colleagues um, was having what's down like classic gout. You know, ankle and toe would get swollen and painful and last a few days and go away. He said, but my uric acid is normal. I said, well, send me the results. His uric acid was 8, and his normal range in his lab was 8.5. So that was a normal level for him, but anything physiologically over 6.8 is abnormal. One well, of those absolute levels. Um, luckily for us, the diagnosis of first MTP swelling is gout, 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 and maybe infection if somebody stepped on a, on a nail. <laughs> There's not much else it does, first MTP swelling. So I usually tell the residents if you see a 45 year old, overweight, football watching, beer guzzling male, it's going to be gout, and nothing else can be, unless you stepped on a, on a nail recently. Why does it have a proclivity for that joint? It's, uh, well, Peter Simpkin, who's a gout-ologist, you know, some of you know Peter. Peter says it's because you have a little osteoarthritis in there. It's a cool distal joint. You're really active on it. You irritate it. You get fluid and uric acid go in. And in the middle of the night, as you put your foot up, the fluid goes out. Uric acid stays behind, supersaturates, and gives you gout. So why do the heck why the heck do humans have uric acid anyway? Okay? So humans, large apes, and Dalmatian dogs for some darn reason lack uricase. Uricase converts insoluble uric acid into soluble allantoin. We don't have that. Unfortunately. There are some now some products that are uricase, but unfortunately, because we don't have uricase, what does that mean? We can use them for a certain period of time, then become immunogenic because we don't have uric acid. So uric acid is felt to be a selective advantage for humans early in our, I guess, our history, but in, especially in salt-poor areas. What's also fascinating is this theory that uric acid does indeed raise blood pressure and allows us to perfuse our brain as we walk upright. <laughs> now, I would ask, why the heck don't giraffes have uric acid? <laughs> <laughs> So it doesn't quite work that easily. So what's, what's been recognized is uh, the role of hyperuricemia and hypertension. So hyperuricemia is present in a big chunk of people with hypertension. And if you're an adolescent, the vast majority of adolescents with hypertension have hyperuricemia. Okay, maybe that role of, uh, of increasing our blood pressure. In animal models where your case is blocked, the pressure that correlates with the level of uric acid. Uh, as it turns out, hyperuricemia may lead to some microvascular damage in the kidney. The endothelium proliferates uh, uh, 
sort of muscle cells proliferates, uh, activation of the vein, the tensin system is present when you have high levels of uric acid. Uh, over time, you get enough damage that it becomes uric acid independent and salt, uh, salt dependent. Um, and uh, this is not a new finding. In fact, hyperuricemia has been associated with hypertension for a long time. Um, in fact, uh, it's also been associated with what we'll talk about in a second with cardiovascular disease. And I remember as a fellow, a paper came out uh, implicating hyperuricemia and coronary artery disease. I remember as uh, we sat around, this is the late 80s, we sat around sort of chuckling about the fact that these poor, deluded primary care doctors were putting these patients with coronary artery disease on allopurinol. But it turns out they were right, probably. Well, they're not quite right yet, but we're not doing that as of yet. But that may be coming down the road. Um, and I'll tell you why in just a few minutes. So this is a patient, this is a group of patients who had chronic kidney disease, and all that was done, and they were followed over time, and all that was done was put them on allopurinol. You see on the bottom there, the uric acid for the treatment group went from 9.7 down to 5.8 in the normal range. The control group stayed high. And look at the GFRs over time. So those who had uh, allopurinol, the GFR stayed relatively stable. For those who had continued hyperuricemia, the creatinines went progressively higher. Uh, or the GFR went, uh, went much higher. This is Peter Simkin, as I mentioned, who was saying earlier, looked at the pre and post uh, creatinines on these patients. You can see the patient with allopurinol had very stable creatinines for the most part, um, where those who were not on allopurinol were much higher um, and tended to be less stable over time. So again, this role of hyperuricemia as a possible um, um, risk factor for more rapid progression in patients with chronic kidney disease has been identified. This is a, a study from Turkey doing sort of the same thing, um, uh, hyperuricemia without gout, allopurinol group, uh, what happened to their GFR if you you, if you uh, this is, again, this is GFR. Um, yeah, this is GFR. This is so improved, and true with allopurinol, where if you had the controls, didn't improve at all. Again, implicating the possibility of hyperuricemia or allopurinol as a potential protector of GFR in patients with underlying kidney disease. I think stones. What's that? Kidney stones. It also decreases kidney stones as well. Uh, that wasn't the major cause of their CKD. But good, good point. <coughs> so how does uric acid induce damage? This is from a, a review paper in renal failure in 2012. Uh, so it uh, affects endothelial dis, uh, function, <coughs> impairs nitric oxide to production and release. Uh, you get increasing oxidative stress through xanthine oxidase, if you've got in mind. You get LDL oxidation and lipid um, peroxidation. Flame activation, vascular smooth muscle cells, proliferation, and pro inflammatory cytokines are present when high levels of uric acid are present. As it turned out, xanthine oxidase, which I didn't realize until I prepared for this talk, is a superoxide producing enzyme, and allopurinol inhibits that. So it might be that, these, that the allopurinol is doing some of the work um, that we think lowering the uric acid is doing. But again, just to, uh, to reemphasize this point, that hyperuricemia is associated with kidney injury damage dysfunction. Um, and again, Rick Johnson, who used to be here, some of you may know Rick Johnson was uh, a nephrologist here many years ago. He's now at the University of Colorado. He's, uh, here's another interesting uh, caveat to hyperuricemia. And one of the reasons why uh, hyperuricemia may be more common these days it is from high fructose corn syrup. Introduced in 1967, common sweetener. Does anybody have their high fructose corn syrup uh, drink with them? Uh, the answer. So, uh, most common cause or source of high, uh, high, high, uh, high fructose corn syrup is sugary drinks, fruit, fruit juices, and also uh, sodas. So we've gone from zero to 29 kilograms per year per person in the United States. 
So all of us here have about uh, 60, 60 pounds of high fructose, high fructose corn syrup that we eat every year. Yeah. Somebody says, I, I hardly drink that many sodas, but some of us are supposed to drink 43,000 sodas in our lifetime. Wow. You have to have to work at that. Uh, anyway, as, as it turns out, uh, fructose, um, fructose is, a, is a primary sugar uh, sucrose that we often eat in our cereal is a combination of glucose and fructose. So we all get some fructose uh, in our diet, no matter what kind of sugars we eat. Um, fructose depletes ATP, which then revs up the purine system and increases the production of uric acid. High fructose uh, diets are also linked to obesity, hypertension, hyperuricemia, and also insulin resistance. That's the other thing that can do. So it's, uh, it's, it's one of those things that can really affect the metabolic syndrome that uh, is so associated with uh, hyperuricemia. So I love this. This is uh, from my Dr. Choi did this. So I was looking at sweet and soft drinks, diet soft drinks, fruit juices, and apple or orange what the risk of gout is by a dietary questionnaire. Uh, and you see those who have the most sweet and soft drinks have the highest uh, relative risk of gout. But even apple or orange did that as well. So that's a little bit concerning. So I said here, Hampton generation equals the gout generation. <laughs> and apple a day puts the gout in play. <laughs> And again, free fructose, they try to estimate the amount of fructose people are eating, again, indicating that there is a, uh, a dose relationship between the risk of gout and the amount of fructose that you eat. And actually, 100 years ago, Sir William Osler uh, suggested a diet low in fructose for gouty patients. Uh, men with the highest intake of sweet and soft drinks have an 85% higher risk of gout than those who hardly use them at all. Uh, and we've actually talked to our patients now about reducing their use of fructose when they do have gout as a way of trying to lower uric acid levels without pharmacology. I mentioned about insulin resistance as well. And then I think the final point I want to make is that hyperuricemia has recently been identified as a cause of increased total mortality in patients, probably through uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, so um, we know that you're seeing is associated with other risk factors of coronary disease, such as hypertension, hyperlipidemia, especially elevation of triglycerides is associated with hyperuricemia and insulin resistance. Xanthine oxidase activity is increased uh, during cardiac ischemia and heart failure for the reasons I've already mentioned. And then treatment of interior with inhibitors of uh, xanthine oxidase has a favorable uh, effect on endothelial function and myocardial oxygen with the, uh, consumption in experimental models. Is uric acid prognostic in men and women at risk for cardiovascular disease when you control for the other risk factors? And this is a study that was done in Cleveland at a uh, preventative coronary artery disease clinic. So people who are at risk for disease or have some early changes are referred to this clinic. Uh, they looked at 3,000 patients between those years, and they they put their uric acid levels into quartiles. This is a milligram per dl. Then they did a multivariate analysis of other cofactors, and here's all the things they tried to control for: is they tried to isolate uric acid as a potential risk factor for progression of coronary artery disease. Here's a survival by a quartile of uric acid. You see there's a very nice dose relationship between survival and uric acid levels. The highest quartile having the highest mortality rates. Uh, and the, the major cause of death was actually coronary artery disease. So here's what they looked at in terms of multivariate models. You can see the relative or, or the uh, hazard ratio for patients who have various levels of various other risk factors. But uh, uric acid definitely uh, plays out as an independent significant risk factor for all-cause mortality in this patient group. And uh, I want to point out for each increase in one milligram per DL of certain uric acid, the risk of death rises by about 26%. Here's a study from 2013, just hot off the press. 
This is from uh, Taiwan, uh, Lin and, and, Card and his colleagues. Again, they found the exact same thing, that uh, uric acid levels were uh, predictive of all-cause mortality. <coughs> One can argue there's other risk factors. They've got probably hypertension and got other sorts of things. But when you control for this, again, uric acid comes out as an independent risk factor for this process. <coughs> and I'm sure you can see that very well. But again, indicating that um, this is the um, um, uh, cardiac uh, mortality also is related to uh, hyperuricemia, as is the all-cause all mortality. So this is done by one of our colleagues, um, <clears throat> um, Andy Luck, who used to be at the VA, now is in private practice. He actually took the, the VA database. And I, this is a fascinating study. So he looked at mortality by use of allopurinol, with the theory that if you lowered uric acids, you might, age might live longer. But look what he found. So if you look down here at the uric acid levels, at the initial uric acid in this group of large number of 9,000 patients, the initial uric acid was 8.2. Um, after seven years, it was 7.5 in the, in, the, in the treatment group and 7.2 in the control group, both still elevated. But if you look at the, uh, the actual uh, results, those who were in allopurinol had a lower <coughs> death rate um, uh, than those who, uh, who were not in allopurinol, even though the uric acids weren't that much different. Again, asking the question, is it hyperuricemia or is allopurinol that tends to modify this risk? Anyway, uh, that's still to be worked out. It's a, it's a really fascinating sort of uh, candidate. So we know that uric acid is an independent risk factor for all-cause mortality. Uh, the known history of CAD, not a significant predictor in those without established disease. Um, it's also important not only in the, in the Caucasians, but also African Americans, and probably even more so. Um, and the uric acid can uh, uh, reduce a bunch of factors that are, are beneficial for maintaining coronary flow. So there's an there's indication that it makes some biologic sense as well. And then this fascinating uh, observation that inhibiting xanthine oxidase may have an impact on mortality it needs to be further explored as well. All right. Um, there's lots of reasons to reduce the uric acid now just besides uh, trying to prevent gout. So I've got some other reasons. Now I tell my patients this, and there is evidence that not only will take care of your gout long term, but you need to live long term and your kidneys may be protected. So all my patients would often go off their allopurinol when they felt good, and they weren't having gouty attacks. Um, but gout, as you know, is a very intermittent sort of process, and now we have other reasons to help keep our patients on long-term therapy. Are we, are we ready to put people with hyperuricemia and coronary disease and CKD on allopurinol? Not yet, but I try to find some reason to do it. Oh, you had a gout attack five years ago? Well, we put a chance of allopurinol. Uh, so I, I believe the data. I think the data is, is mounting, and it's, uh, it's uh, good data. And so there's other reasons to put people on allopurinol uh, besides those things we talked about. But, uh, I remember Bruce Gillen, when I was uh, just out of my fellowships, used to teach me, uh, this is nothing, uh, Bruce, I was just the way that we did it at the time. You know, you don't put people on um, uh, allopurinol just for a gouty attack because it may take 10 years for it to develop TOFI. So his indication was the presence of TOFI or uric acid stones. Because we put these people on, hypo, on uh, hypouricemic therapy with allopurinol. I think nowadays we have a much different attitude of more aggressive therapy, early therapy. Once you develop your TOFI, you know, that's, that's kind of late. It's like treating rheumatoid arthritis after you develop an erosion. We've become to the point where we want to prevent erosion, so we treat people very early with these, these drugs. The same attitude I think is occurring with uh, gouty patients. Treat them very early to prevent some of these long-term complications. I've got one more slide to show you here. And evidence-based medicine is really the range these days, but it's only as good as your interpretation of the data. And uh, here's some of the interpretation of the data. Say, what's that mountain goat doing up way up here in a cloud bank? <laughs> evidence-based, right? Like, would you recommend aspirin therapy? You know, 
That's a great question, and uh, based on what I see the literature going, it may just well be. But they may be part of a whole package of trying to prevent coronary artery disease right. in patients. Fish oil, aspirin, alpernol. Okay, it'll, be, it'll, be, it'll be the AA drug, <laughs> aspirin, alpernol, and something else. Oh, a statin. How about a statin? Or fish oil. Statin. 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 You haven't mentioned colchicine. Now, does that still work? Uh, and how does it work? Is it any new theories of how it's... Uh, well, you know, I just showed you a paper that's uh, well, we got, actually a paper company that about a year ago got published recently. Um, they found the use of colchicine actually may be a potential preventer of acute MIs. Uh, and it's anti inflammatory, it does those sorts of things, that, as, you, as you well know. We still use a lot of colchicine as a way of preventing attacks, but it does lower uric acid. But you, in fact, I was always taught you don't want to try to lower the uric acid during the acute attack. No, so you don't just, normally start an allopurinol during the acute attack. Right. When you wait till the attack is over, put them on colchicine, right. then start the allopurinol, and lower the uric acid gradually. Right. Well, so let me tell you, uh, I got uh, just a couple minutes. There's a really sad story about colchicine. Yeah. I've okay, told it before. So you know, we use colchicine for 1,500 years. I don't know how long it's been around. It's been around for a long, long time. Uh, and it was five cents a tablet. Um, some enterprising company realized that it never had any official approval from the FDA. So they did a study, showed that it worked. Well, wow, surprise. <laughs> Do that work and got official FDA approval and have exclusive marketing rights for like five to seven years. So now it's <coughs> five dollars a tablet. And some of the patients who were doing just fine on it have now been kicked off by the insurance because they don't pay for the five dollar a day tablet of colchicine. That's your, got your government at work for you. That's really, that's disgusting. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how they got that by, uh, you know, the, uh, the rheumatology committee uh, to approve this, uh, this drug. So, anyway, because, you know, we've used it for so many years, we know it works just fine. It's like aspirin having a study right. and going from a penny to a dollar a tablet. So, because somebody just finally just uh, decided to show that it works. Uh, and the company markets it. So, anyway. Any other questions about gout? It's been a pleasure to be here today, and uh, hopefully, uh, well, hopefully we'll have news. Run out of diseases. We'll have to have you back next year. Every year. Yeah. Start planning. Every year. Thank you. Thank you.